Good afternoon. My name is Jakob Stoker Nielsen from the Department of Scandinavian Studies here at UCL. And on behalf of the Lunch Hour Lectures Organizing Committee, I am very thrilled to be able to introduce to you uh, this the speaker of the day, Dr. Simon Revit. He is a senior lecturer in history and philosophy of science in the UCL Department of Science and Technology Studies. He has published a, a book in 2010 with the University of Chicago Press called Fireworks, Pyrotechnic Arts and Sciences in European History, which uh, is also today's theme, I imagine. The title of today's talk is Bright Sparks, the History and Science of Fireworks. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Jakob. Uh, so hopefully everyone can, can hear me okay. Um, thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. Um, I understand that it's extremely freakish warm weather out there at the moment. So, so a special thanks for coming in on, that, on this rare occasion uh, for a November day. Uh, November in the, in the British calendar is, is better known uh, for fireworks. Uh, and that's the topic that I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, my, my actual, my big interest in life is science and art. So I started out... Um, actually doing art, as a, uh, doing fine art uh, uh, for a couple of years, and then I switched to studying the history of science. And I won't bore you with the details of how that all happened, but it's left me with a kind of perennial interest in what is the relationship between science and art? How are they connected? Um, how are they integrated? How are they made distinct in different periods of history? And that's, that's why I became interested in fireworks, because fireworks are a really good um, practice which involves both science and art. Um, and it turns out that in history, um, the, the way that fireworks were understood as being scientific or artistic was changing all the time. So no one's ever been quite sure, is this a science, is it an art, is it chemistry, uh, you know, is it, um, does it involve mathematics, architecture, all kinds of different things. Um, and so that makes it great for me because it, it gives me a chance to see historically how different people kind of approach this question of the relationship of science and art um, at different times. So fireworks is a kind of case study for me. Um, it's also a fantastic topic. So uh, it's, been, it's always great fun to, to um, do the history of fireworks. And I'm going to tell you a little bit today about the history of fireworks and about this question of, of the relationship between science and art and what fireworks can tell us about it. Um, so let's start off at the place I think everybody is quite familiar with, uh, and that's China. So uh, the Chinese origins of fireworks are, are pretty well known to, to everyone. Um, the, the actual way that fireworks began in China is quite interesting. Um, nobody really knows what happened, um, but one theory that's been put forward is that fireworks uh, were originally developed as a way to uh, ward off uh, mountain men or, or evil spirits. So if you put uh, dried bamboo on a fire, the little air pockets inside it will make it explode. It cracks. And the thought is that gunpowder, which was known to the Chinese um, uh, by, the, by the 9th century, um, gunpowder could be rammed into these bamboo stalks to amplify that effect. So it made them give a really bad, big bang, and then that keeps, keeps your uh, uh, spirits away, keeps them under control. Um, and, um, and over time, this develops into the firecracker and then into all kinds of different types of fireworks. And we know that by, by the um, 12th century, there were fireworks displays in China for visits of the emperor uh, and celebrations. And uh, there are various different kinds of fireworks. Um, my favorite one is earth rats. Um, so an earth rat is the, is the Chinese term for, for what we would call a rocket. Uh, and the reason it's called an earth rat is that when you initially uh, use these, these fireworks, so they look the same as the rockets that we have, but you set them off on the ground. And then they would fly, fly along the ground in a in a, in a wiggly pattern, and the idea was there was a little rat running around. Um, and at some point, somebody had the idea, well, why don't we fire them into the, into the sky? And lo and behold, there's the, the rocket born. 
So, um, so the Chinese also had smoke balls, uh, which would send out billowing clouds of coloured smoke um, and uh, wheels. They would set fireworks off on kites, uh, set them off in the water. So they had a very developed um, pyrotechnic culture um, very, very early on. This is before, much before uh, fireworks came to Europe. Now, um, fireworks arrive in Europe um, probably in the 13th century. Um, the Mongols, uh, so you can see some, some Mongols here. Uh, there's a, you can just see there's an exploding uh, bomb uh, up in the, up in the, top, the top there. Um, the Mongols uh, invaded uh, various parts of Eurasia, gradually spread west, got all the way to Central Europe, and they probably brought with them uh, gunpowder technology and, and firecrackers, and then Europeans got figured out how to do this. And um, in the 1260s, the monk, the English monk Roger Bacon, talks about uh, what, what he describes as a, a children's toy made with saltpeter that makes a bang. Um, and he's almost definitely talking about firecrackers. So someone maybe had got hold of these, brought them, and he'd seen them. Um, and he compared them to thunder and lightning. That's a very common way of talking about fireworks uh, for the next several centuries. They're kind of artificial thunder and lightning. And we'll see later on how that's actually quite, quite important for the scientific uh, use of fireworks. Now, um, by the late 15th century, you get quite elaborate fireworks displays in Europe. Um, and the, the best of the lot is definitely this. I don't know if we can have the lights down, because uh, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see. Uh, if anyone can hit. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this, um, this image is of the Girandola um, Festival in Rome, which took place over the Castel Sant'Angelo on the banks of the river Tiber. Um, and it starts at the end of the 15th century, and it was done to celebrate the election of a new pope. So the Castel Sant'Angelo was originally a, a mausoleum for the emperor Hadrian and his family. It then became a fortress uh, and then a residence for the pope. It's this big, imposing castle, uh, so it offered protection. And it was also used as a stage for this very dramatic fireworks display um, that's really, I, I would say, the first big fireworks display in Europe. Um, and um, what would happen is that the walls of the castle would be illuminated with candles uh, on the night of the, of the festivities, and then fireballs would be shot into the air that were compared to stars falling from heaven. And then a huge explosion of rockets was sent up um, to create this huge burst of light um, that um, uh, everybody was in entirely astonished by. Um, and this is, this is still going on today, actually, the, the Girandola Festival. So you can still see fireworks fired off over the cast Castel Sant'Angelo. Um, but it must have been a, a really incredibly apocalyptic experience for people, because this is a new technology. People were not familiar with fireworks the way we are today. Um, some people might only see a display once in their, in their lifetime. Um, and um, this is a, a truly kind of transformative e event. Um, and people compared it to the apocalypse, the end of the world. Um, and it's appropriate, you know, it's for the, the when one pope, uh, pope's um, life ended and another pope came in, it was literally like a kind of a, 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 a death of the world and then rebirth uh, under a new pope. So these, these incredible fireworks symbolized that um, and, and were very, very impressive on people. And what you see after the Girandola is that courts around Europe imitated this fireworks display. So really this is the, 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 the kind of root of, of all our fireworks displays today in Europe at any rate, um, because people imitated this. And um, they used all kinds of ingenious pyrotechnic devices to create ever more elaborate and interesting effects. So we'll just uh, talk about a few of those for 
a moment. Um, I should just say, before we do that, that these were quite terrifying experiences for a lot of people. Um, so, again, today we're quite used to fireworks uh, being fun and pleasurable and, and there's lots of oohs and ahs, um, but this was scary stuff in the, in the 16th, 15th, 16th century. Um, and uh, there's lots of reports of... Uh, uh, now, the nobility say this, so whether it's true or not, we have to take with a, be a bit of caution, but they would say that people were, were often unable to tell the difference between these kinds of vast artificial fires and real fires and explosions and, and thunder and lightning. Um, so it would have been a scary experience. Anyway, by the uh, 15th, 16th century, uh, there's a lot of complicated and interesting fireworks out there. Um, so here is an image from a, a manual on how to make fireworks uh, from the early 17th century. Um, by a Frenchman named Francois de Melt. And uh, he's describing all the different effects that you could get with rockets. So uh, you can see how some of them produce stars. And, and a star was a firework. It was a type of firework. We still use it today. Um, it gives the, the appearance of a star falling down in, in the sky. Um, and... Um, Already with the girandola, you have these, and they are a mainstay of fireworks all the way through. Um, one can say lots of interesting things about astrology and fireworks in relation to that, but I don't have time today, but there we are. Um, so uh, lots of different effects. Um, people classified fireworks in this period um, by the Aristotelian element. So Aristotle, the ancient Greek uh, natural philosopher, philosopher, said that there are four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. So um, the people who made fireworks in this period classified their fireworks along those lines. So they said that, well, fire is obviously taken care of. Um, fireworks of the air would be things like rockets and bombs that you shoot up either by having the gunpowder in the rocket or by using a mortar to shoot a bomb up and then it explodes in the sky. Um, Rockets of the, uh, sorry, uh, fireworks of the earth would be on the ground, uh, so things like candles, fountains, uh, we're familiar with, with those kinds of fireworks, I think, from, from back garden displays, because most of those are, are, are ground fireworks. And then the one that we don't really have anymore today, but it's very interesting, is fireworks of water. So lots of recipes for fireworks in this period involve making rockets and bombs that would go off in the water. And fireworks were almost invariably fired over water because the, the, the surface reflected the lights in the, in the dark. Um, and they had very, very clever fireworks. They would go underwater and appear to have sunk, and then they would bob back up again, and set, you'd see sparks flying out, and then they would disappear, and uh, so on and so forth. So these are well, what they call water balls, uh, and there are water rockets and all kinds. So Aristotelian fireworks. And there were two things, I think, two principles that were really at play in these early fireworks in Europe. One of them was to imitate nature. So I've already mentioned stars, but there were suns and comets, um, thunder and lightning, volcanoes. Uh, fireworks were a way to imitate these dramatic, fiery, um, natural phenomena. And the other thing, and you can see that here, is exotic unfamiliar, exciting motions, movement. People love the, the animated nature of fireworks. Um, and, and people even talked about fireworks as being a kind of living, living thing. So um, uh, they, would, they would move around in unpredictable ways, and they almost seemed to be alive. And this was something that people liked about fireworks at this time. Now, another feature of fireworks in the early modern period that we don't really... Um, have in fireworks today is what they called machines. So fireworks were put on by the courts. Uh, fireworks were very expensive to do, so people would spend the equivalent of, of millions of, of pounds to do one big firework display. And fireworks were not just done for pleasure, but they were done to celebrate the courts, princes' uh, power, essentially. 
Um, so they have kind of sponsorship by, by courts, and they included a lot of decorations and narrative elements that would um, honour the prince or the nation. Uh, they might be done for a triumph in a battle or a, a coronation or a wedding. So they are um, essentially a kind of propaganda spectacle in this period. And um, going back to the Pope and hit the use of, fire, of the Castel San Angelo for, for fireworks, um, many displays were set off from what they called a machine, which was an artificial temple or castle that was built often to full scale, um, and the artificers, the people who did fireworks, would stand inside and then set off the fireworks from inside. Um, and um, these, are, these in themselves are a fascinating uh, genre of art. So you can see a very famous one here. This is the uh, machine built for the fireworks in 1749 for the piece of Isle La Chapelle in Green Park here in London. Um, and uh, this is the performance that Handel's music for fireworks was written for. Um, and uh, in the long run, the music was more successful than the fireworks. Um, but in this case, we have a classical temple. This was constructed out of uh, wooden, with a wooden frame and, and um, uh, canvas and painted to look real. And then all the fireworks were set off from it. Unfortunately, what happened during the display is that uh, the wing burnt down by accident. And it was a big scandal. Um, and there was a cartoon. As far as I know, the only satirical cartoon ever done about fireworks uh, in the Times in uh, uh, the following day uh, that called it the grand whim for posterity to laugh at. Uh, so it was a bit of a disaster, but there we go. Um, uh, the, the people who put it off were also a mixture of Brits and Italians, and they ended up all fighting with each other, uh, and it was a, it was a bit chaotic. Uh, anyway, there we are. So I mentioned the people who, who put on fireworks displays, and they were known as artificers. So uh, in French, you talk about feu d'artifice. Uh, the term used in, the, in this period for fireworks is artificial fireworks. It just means they're full of art. Um, rather than that they're fake. Um, and artificers were the people who put these on. Um, and typically they were people who belonged to the military. So they worked for the artillery. Um, they were housed in the Tower of London, later on in Woolwich Arsenal, in the case of London. Um, you can see one of them here. This is John Babington. Uh, this is one of only about three or four images of uh, portraits of uh, fireworks artificers that I, that I know of, so it's very, very unusual. Um, and what Babington was actually saying in this book, which he wrote on fireworks, um, is um, basically, look at us. Aren't we producing incredible effects today in fireworks? Um, this should be celebrated. I should be celebrated as someone who's capable of doing this. Um, and, um, and these really were the kind of uh, most advanced special effects of their of their time, these fireworks. And you can see um, some of the contraptions that he came up with in his book. So it's not just rockets and, and, and wheels, but all kinds of elaborate auto automata and, and dragons and so on and so forth. So that's just a little introduction to fireworks, uh, the, the basics, if you like, of, of what they involved in the early modern period uh, in their first couple of centuries. Now, of course, that's also the period of the scientific revolution, of this transformation in the way that people understood the natural world, uh, going from an old scholastic medieval tradition that looked to the ancients for their knowledge to a new kind of science that was based on experiment, on observation, and on a new astronomy. So this is a picture of the Copernican system of the world, with the sun at the centre and the earth travelling around it, uh, in a system that was perfected by famous names, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. So the question here is, what has this got to do with fireworks? Um, and it turns out that actually there are some interesting connections between these events. And essentially, what it comes down to is that the artificers, people like Babington were producing extremely impressive 
machinery and effects and imitations of nature in the period of the scientific revolution. And they earned a great deal of credit with the courts who employed them. So people who made fireworks in this period are a big deal. People are impressed. And what the natural philosophers, the scientists of their time did, is in some respects they kind of piggybacked on that credit by incorporating fireworks into the things that they were doing and using fireworks to, to talk about nature and some of that credit that, that fireworks had accrued was then transferred over to these new ideas and new practices uh, involving science. And remember that, that the, the new ideas and the new practices, experiment and so on, uh, in, in, the, in the new science didn't have any credit at this time. They're new. No one's ever heard of them. Why should I believe this guy Isaac Newton, who, who's that, uh, you know, uh, never heard of him? So, so the, the natural philosophers had to get some kind of credit, and one of the ways they did it was by looking to these very popular fireworks um, and pyrotechnics. So let's look at an, at an example of that. Uh, this is my favourite firework uh, of the early modern period, and I think it was the favourite firework of early moderns, and that's the fiery dragon. What you do is you build a tower over here and another one over here, and you put a rope between them, and then you make a, a dragon about so big out of paper mache, paper, uh, wooden frame, paint it bright colours, fill it up with rockets, and then you attach it to the rope, and if you're really clever, you can make it so that the, when you ignite the rockets, the dragon goes shooting across to the other side, uh, belching out fire and smoke, and then just as it gets to this side, rockets firing in the opposite direction ignite, and they send it shooting back over to this side. And you can, Can you hear me? Yep, yep great. So, uh, if you can do that, you get your nice, impressive spectacle. And the fiery dragon was the main piece shown in fireworks displays in the 16th and 17th century. It appears again and again. And what's interesting is that it was taken up by uh, people who were doing their equivalent of science at the time, what they called natural magic, uh, not to be confused with, with magic, you know, rabbits and hats and things, but, but it was really like a kind of experimental, pr primitive experimental science. Natural magicians took this spectacle and incorporated it into their work, and then they called it, they used a new word to describe it, and that was experiment. So here is the book. Uh, if we could have the lights down a little bit, again, that would be terrific. Um, this gentleman is Giambattista della Porta. He was a, a magician, a magus from Naples in, in Italy, and he wrote many splendid books, one of which uh, is this, Natural Magic, and it includes a recipe for the fiery dragon. And della Porta says, uh, first of all, he says this is an experiment. This is, this is something, a, a new kind of technical engagement with, with natural things with materials that we haven't done before. And he says, maybe it will teach us, inspire us to learn how to fly. So it sounds a bit odd now, but at the time, that's a very bold thought. Um, unfortunately, the way he thought you would do it, um, he says, if you're, you get a child and you teach them to flap their arms at a young age, and by the time they're about 30, they'll be strong enough to actually take off. Uh, so sadly, that method didn't really work, but the thought is a very, very good one, and I think that, that deserves a, a being called a scientific thought, a what if, how, how might we do this? Um, and it's inspired by this dragon. So what you see is this gradual movement, and this happens in other cases, this gradual movement of these very impressive fireworks into books of natural magic, natural philosophy, and experiment. Now, so impressed were the natural philosophers by these fireworks that they actually invented a whole philosophy of nature based on the idea that miniature 
gunpowder explosions, essentially, were responsible for all kinds of different natural phenomena. And um, what's known as the nitrosulfurous philosophy, uh, or what's slightly easier to say, the gunpowder theory of nature, uh, flourished in the 17th century. It's completely forgotten today. Um, people think of mechanical philosophy uh, and then, and then um, various other things, but not gunpowder theory, but there was one. It was used to explain things like thunder and lightning, uh, the motion of comets, the formation of stars, the action of volcanoes, uh, so quite a lot of different kinds of usually meteorological and um, astronomical phenomena. Another thing it was used for is to explain how your muscles work. So we can do this, and uh, sometimes we get muscle spasms of uncontrollable motion in our muscles. Why does that happen, said 17th century natural philosophers? Maybe there are tiny, tiny particles of sulfur and nitre, potassium, uh, potassium nitrate, in our blood, and just as an explosion of fireworks or gunpowder creates this amazing animated effect, perhaps miniature explosions inside the blood vessels are producing these actions. And there was a big debate in the 17th century about whether there were explosions going on inside your body all the time. And the conclusion at the end was, no, there aren't. <laughs> but the point here, I'm not defending the gunpowder theory, but I do want to say that it shows how fireworks and gunpowder had an impact on natural philosophy in this period. They incorporate these things into natural philosophy um, and it helps to make it, it helps to make people attend to it, gives it credit. Now, very interestingly, there's two things that the gunpowder theory dealt with very well for, for a few decades. One of them was um, things like thunder, explaining thunder and lightning and, and, and meteors. Uh, the other thing was, was more medical, explains how, how the body is animated. If gunpowder produces such incredible effects, maybe some kind of gunpowdery um, uh, thing going on in the body animates it, brings it to life. And it's very interesting because in the 18th century, those two things are re- imagined and explained with a new kind of substance, and that substance is electricity. So thunder and lightning, or lightning is a form of electricity, we learn in the 18th century, and the body is animated, perhaps, they say, by some kind of electric spark. The famous example of that is Frankenstein, okay, the, the spark of life. And I would argue that that is a leftover from the gunpowder theory. Um, the gunpowder theory sets the, kind of the, the frame of what electricity will come to explain. And it turns out that what was known as the electric fire very much owed its early understanding to pyrotechnics. In other words, people said there's a new phenomenon, so they just discovered electricity uh, in the early 18th century, they said, there's a new phenomenon. We don't know what this is. We've never come across anything like it. But it's kind of like fireworks. It's a little bit like pyrotechnic gunpowder effect. So they call it the electric fire. They talk about sparks. Um, you make electricity with a battery. That's an artillery term. And so on and so forth. And you see quite a lot of uh, continuities between electric culture and fireworks. Now, very... Briefly, I'll just show you a couple of examples. Um, this is one of the first um, very popular electrical experiments. Um, what you do is you charge someone up, and then you get a spark to come out their finger and ignite a spoonful of alcohol. Um, and uh, it's spectacular. It's, it's, it's a kind of experiment that's spectacular in the way that fireworks are. Electric fire is understood to be a kind of liquid fire. And that's exactly how people at the time understood fireworks. In fact, one of the most popular fireworks in this period, and we're talking about the mid-18th century now, was the jet de feu, a jet of fire, as if it's a kind of liquid that can be sent up in fountains. And you also see, excuse me, you also see that 
images of electricity resemble fireworks images of the time. And you can, I, I can't show you the, the pictures, we don't have time, but you get the idea here. This is a picture of what electricity is thought to look like. So, science picked up fireworks, ran with them, if you like, uh, took their credit and used it to build a new kind of experimental practice that was itself very popular. By the end of the 18th century, the credit of science was the thing that was in the ascendant. And what you see then, and just to finish off here, is that the fireworks people then borrowed from the scientists, from the natural philosophers, and used science to reinvent fireworks. And let's just finish with a, an example of that. These are optical fireworks, where um, you have a little cabinet here, you, put, you light it from behind, and then you have spinning wheels that produce um, patterns that uh, appear to imitate fireworks. And the idea was that you were using optical principles, you could add mirrors and lenses and things to imitate fireworks. So here you've got the, the reverse action going on, that fireworks are learning from science, just as science had learned from fireworks. So I'm going to conclude. We'll pass over that. So what do we, what do we take away from this, this quick story of science and art? Um, it's very clear that art and science have borrowed from each other regularly through history. And that these um, influences these borrowings are very, very creative. They lead to all kinds of new technology, new kinds of spectacle, new kinds of understanding. So it's a very fruitful relationship, and it's one I think that we should encourage. If you look at the history of fireworks, you can see how this happened. How did it work in the past? One thing was that there were institutions that encouraged this kind of mixing together of art and science, the courts. Uh, actually did that very well for several centuries. Secondly, there were spaces, public spaces, that allowed artists, uh, artificers and natural philosophers to mingle. Um, city squares were a great place where this, this interaction happened. And thirdly, these people all produced publications that explained what they did. And they read each other's publications, and they learned, and they drew that knowledge and put it into their own practice. So all of these three things, I think, are worth encouraging if we want to carry on this rich culture of fireworks, science, and art. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Simon Verrett. That was a that was great artifice in your, in your lecture today. We have time for, for questions. Please, yes. Um, Let, wait for a microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> the microphones will be passed around. Um, th uh, thank you. That was that was great. Um, you mentioned um, ast astrology and fireworks, and obviously not got time to go into it in great detail. But I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about the connection. Yes, absolutely. So, um, in the 16th, 17th century, astrology was very popular, um, especially at courts where princes decided on their activities. Uh, in partly by um, consulting astrologers. And there is a strong sense that what goes on in the heavens is reflected on in what goes on on Earth. And what are fireworks if they're not an imitation of that relationship? So um, you're presenting with artifice stars and suns and comets in the, in the sky, and you're relating them to the actions of princes. So astrological... Um, decorations would very often feature in fireworks. And, and one thing that's interesting, I, I, I have yet to, to really research this, but um, there's a couple of manuscripts from the time that show that um, the artificers, the gunners who made fireworks, would do their work depending on a horoscope. So, so they would mix the gunpowder on the right day uh, and uh, make the fireworks on the right day and perform them depending on the astrological uh, uh, you know, calendar. There was a uh, first down here, and then you, sir. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, what about the downside? I mean, for instance, the people who made the fireworks 
and the accidents and perhaps even skullduggery. Um, you know, what, what, you know, you haven't said much about that. And what about the celebrations for working class people as well as the aristocrats? I know about November the 5th, but did it um, embrace a, a lightening of life and a time where they'd use it for celebration even though they're pretty poor? Thank you. Well, that's a terrific question. Um, so one thing to say is um, I have talked about the, the courts um, and the, there were accidents, there were problems. Um, sometimes, and this is a rather slightly depressing thought, um, sometimes if the accidents happened to the vulgar, as they called them at the time, that was considered part of the entertainment for the aristocracy. Um, so there's an there's a example in Russia where this happens, uh, which is rather sad. Um, but, um, but there were definitely accidents. Uh, part of the excitement of fireworks was that they were risky uh, operations, so things could go wrong, um, and, uh, and they did on occasion. I think at the same time that you know, one of the reasons that these, these are done is a way to bring together people from many different walks of life in a kind of mutual celebration. Um, and you certainly see that happening at different times and places. Um, I think um, William uh, of Orange, when he became king, uh, put great emphasis on, on using fireworks displays to kind of bind together people who had previously been at odds with one another um, in, the, in the Civil War, the Restoration period. Um, and, and the iconography of fireworks under William actually reflects that. So you suddenly start seeing uh, the, the kind of working people in fireworks print, for example, which is very interesting. So there is a, there's, a, there's a long history of a kind of tension between different classes, in Brit certainly in British fireworks displays. You could also say the same for France. Thank you. We had a question here. A technical question. You talked about the Girandola at the Castel Sant'Angelo. There's a, a modern fire, firework that's made today, very, very spectacular, <coughs> called the Girandola. It's a huge horizontal catherine wheel which rises up into the sky, making multiple helixes. Is, is there any connection between those two? Did you have Girandolas at the Girandola? Uh, well, they did have spinning wheels, yes. certainly. So, one of the, so actually, even before the Girandola, uh, one of the first recorded fireworks is, um, is called a gir I'll call it girandole, or girandole. Uh, it's a good word in fireworks, this. Uh, and um, it was a big wheel with fireworks in it that was suspended from a rope that would be put across a street or a town square, and the wheel would rotate horizontally and send out sparks and so on and so forth. Um, and that's, that's talked about by um, Bering Guccio, who was uh, uh, an author on, on metallurgy, writing in the 16th century, and he says that was one of the first fireworks to be seen. Um, so, so this is a kind of mainstay of the, of the um, performance, I think. Thank you. Thanks. We have time for one more question. I could imagine that uh, when the, the church was more Puritan, that fireworks would have been uh, looked down upon and maybe even considered the work of the devil. Was, was there a, a time when, when this was suppressed and, and was maybe risky to do? Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the Puritans in the uh, 17th century didn't like fireworks. The Quakers as well uh, eschewed uh, fireworks. Uh, one, one result of that was that um, actually um, the, the North American British colonies didn't really have many fireworks until the kind of mid-18th century because the Puritans didn't like this. Um, but, but in fact, there was a, after about the middle of the 18th century, there was a very healthy fireworks um, culture in North America, um, initially to celebrate uh, French and British kings, and then, of course, after independence, uh, you have uh, the July the 4th fireworks. Um, but yes, there have been, definitely been um, times and, and people who, who don't like fireworks. Uh, the, the Green Park display I showed from 1749 led to a huge dispute uh, among various people about whether fireworks should be had at all in Britain, because surely they were just a waste of money. Um, 
and people had just come out of a period of war and they said we should spend this money on um, uh, you know, looking after the people who've been wounded, not, not setting off gunpowder in Green Park. Uh, so it's always been an issue uh, whether one should do fireworks or not. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for coming today. And obviously, you have learned a lot of things here today you should not try at home. <laughs> uh, and please join me in thanking Dr. Simon Verrett for this uh, illuminating lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.